the Nobel Prize uh, laureates, John Forbes Nash Jr. and Louis Nirnberg, welcome to uh, the Nobel Prize lectures. And welcome also to uh, all the guests who have uh, come to this fantastic occasion to uh, take part in uh, this year's Arbel Lectures. I understand that many of you belong to uh, what was named yesterday as the family of mathematicians, being from a different discipline. So discipline I must say I'm a bit envious that uh, you, the mathematicians, belong to a common family, as we heard Nienberg tell us about yesterday. So yesterday was also an occasion where it was my impression that the whole world was being viewed through the lens of the PDEs, the partial differential equations. And uh, for those of you who haven't read this paper in uh, The Guardian by Jude Oslin, I uh, strongly recommend you to do so because uh, I think it's a fantastic uh, description of what uh, these equations and what these insights have uh, given us when it comes to the understanding of the world that we live in. And I would like to cite from the Guardian paper by Jude Oislin. It's written in this paper that the Norwegian Academy of Science, Sciences and Letters has awarded this year's Abel Prize, and quote, for striking and seminal contributions to the theory of nonlinear partial differential equations and its applications to geometric analysis, and quote. And then Oislin goes on to say it may sound like some distant reality, but it's basically about how we relate to the world, how it changes, and what is possible and what is not. So I think this is a, a description that everybody can relate to. And yesterday at the banquet, there was an extremely interesting discussion about mathematics, in fact, and the king was an active part of it. It was all about Sudoku. What is the commonality? What is the shared feature? between mathematics and Sudoku. And I think uh, the king's conclusion was that you are stuck until you find a solution. <laughs> so uh, here we are, the whole world, at least uh, the world that we inhabit here, is obsessed with PDs and uh, solutions and not being stuck for too long. So if you, you go to the posters outside, you will find a fantastic quote that connects the two laureates of today. We understand that Louis Nienberg never published with John Nash, but um, he has a quote that, as I said, connects the two. In 2002, as you can read on the poster, Louis Nienberg said the following thing, and I quote, about 20 years ago, somebody asked me, were there any mathematicians you would consider as geniuses? I said, I can think of one, and that's John Nash. He had a remarkable mind. He thought about things differently from other people, unquote. Well, this shows the generosity of Louis Nuremberg, I would say, today. There are not only one remarkable mind here, there are two remarkable minds that will share their insight with us today. So with this, I welcome you all once again, and I think we are in for some very interesting lectures and also some soap bubbles, I understand. So uh, this will be a day seen through the lens of PDs and through the lens of mathematics. With this, I give the floor to the president of the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters, Kirsti Strömbull. Please, Kirsti. Thank you. Uh, dear Abel Prize laureates, Louis Nirenberg and John Forbes Nash Jr., dear lecturers and dear audience, Yesterday, John Forbes Nash Jr. and Louis Nirenberg received the Abel Prize. Today, the Abel Lecture are given in honor of the laureates. The La Abel Prize is a prize for outstanding scientific work in mathematics. 
The prize is also a recognition of scientific contributions of exceptional depth and significance for the discipline of mathematics. Alfred Nobel would not establish a prize in mathematics because in his opinion, mathematics had no practical impact. We all know he was wrong. Today's society needs mathematicians. Mathematics plays an important role in modern society. Its infrastructure, buildings, communication system, banking, insurance, and the internet, etc. In mathematics, we often find the clearest examples that advance solutions that are primarily a result of the desire of solve a theoretical problem have had an intentional, unexpectedly great practical importance. The Abel Prize is therefore an obvious recognition of basic research, a research that both the University of Oslo and we, the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters, are highlighting. In just a short period, the Arbel Prize has become one of the great international prizes in mathematics, with members from many different countries who are nominated by the key international mathematics organization. The Arbel Committee deserves most of the honor for the status that the prize has attained. Thank you all. The chair, yeah, <laughs> give an applause for the committee. The chair of the Abel Committee, Professor Jon Rognes, has, together with Professor Christian Ranesa, chair of the Abel Board, arranged today's symposium, the Abel Lecture. And on behalf of the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters, I would like to thank both of you. And now I have the pleasure to give the floor to Jon Rognes. Thank you. Good morning. So, as a mathematician, I'm very grateful to the University of Oslo, to the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters, and the Abel Board for hosting, supporting, and organizing the Abel Prize lectures. This event is an important scientific component of the Abel Week. I'm equally grated, grateful to the August members of the Abel Committee. Three of them are present here today and will chair the three sessions of the program. First, Cédric Villani, professor in Lyon, director of the Institut Henri Pancaré and recipient of the 2010 Fields Medal, will act as chairman for the lectures by Abel laureate John Nash and by professor Camilo de Lelis. Second, Maria J. Esteban, research director at the CNRS, working at University, uh, Université Paris-Dauphin and president-elect of the International Council for Industrial and Applied Mathematics, will chair the session with Abel laureate Louis Nirenberg and Professor Tristan Rivier. Third, Raoul Pandhari Panda, professor at the ETH in Zurich, ICM speaker in 2002, and for example, recipient of the Infosys Prize for Mathematics and the Clay Research Prize, will chair the science lecture this afternoon with Professor John Morgan, Frank Morgan. Pardon me. The fourth member of the ABL committee, Eva Tardos, is professor at Cornell University. She is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a fellow of the American Mathematical Society, and recipient of the Gödel Prize. Due to exams, she was unfortunately not able to come to us this week. I hope very much that she will be able to join us for next year's Abel celebrations. A brief word about the program. So there will be a short coffee break between the first and the second session, and a lunch break served outside between the second and third session. So the second session will start at 11.45 sharp. And the third session will start at 2 p.m. In both cases, please make sure to return in time, to the auditorium in time. After each session, there will be time for one or two questions. And please then use the handheld microphones that will be passed in from the sides uh, along uh, to state your question. So please enjoy these lectures. I am sure that I will. Thank you.
Good morning. It has been a great pleasure and great honor for me to sit on the Abel Committee for the past two years. It is also a pleasure and honor for me to chair this session. So much has been said already yesterday, and so much will be said later today about the work of John Forbes Nash, senior research mathematician from Princeton University, and now laureate of both the Nobel and the Abel Prizes. So my introduction will be exceedingly short. With a few extraordinary contributions from the 50s, Nash triggered a revolution in our way to understand and to attack some problems of partial differential equations related to physics and geometry. His deeply original thinking, his ability to mobilize all his energy to overcome problems in which he was a complete outsider, his talent in making the best of his colleagues' skills, his inspiring writing style, all this has made Nash an iconic figure for generations of mathematicians. At personal level, let me evoke my amazement at reading his celebrated paper on the regularity of non-smooth diffusion equations, the fascinating genesis of which is told in Sylvia Nazar's biography of John Nash, A Beautiful Mind. I also taught and explained the Nash embedding theorems, both smooth and non-smooth, to my student in Ecole Normale Supérieure de Lyon and in University of Lyon, with the passing of time, these results have, none, have lost none of their power for fascinating and inspiring. Today, Professor Nash will tell us briefly about research on which he has been working on, he has been working recently. Quite appropriately, it is in relation with general relativity, a major theory which was published exactly 100 years ago. So let us enjoy the lecture of John Forbes Nash, 2015 Abel Prize Laureate, entitled An Interesting Equation. Come over here. A web page existing uh, for qu quite a while, uh, on the order of 10 or 15 years, that uh, relates to uh, relativity and the relation between the equations of relativity and the actual uh, metric of, of space time. And uh, I had a, I found an, an, an equation which I call the interesting equation. Let's see. This is forward. I found a, I, yeah, it was a research going very far back. Originally, my idea was that. Possibly, photons are subject to a decay in their energy if they have mass, they have a small amount of mass. And I was thinking in around 1949 AD that uh, that would be an interesting concept and it would be 
more favorable to an eternal universe, or a longer lasting universe. And ultimately, I arranged as a graduate student at Princeton to see Einstein. I saw him in presence also in a, of an assistant at his office. Discussion went on for a considerable time, and then Einstein said, well, if you, you have to work really hard over a long time to develop something. Of course, I was a little dip disappointed, but yet, yet that is very reasonable, logically. And he himself was working then on a type of electromagnetic gravitational theory unified, which was uh, not concordant with the existing accepted theory, which was called the Einstein-Maxwell equations, where things just fit together neatly, and you would assume that that is, is correct because of its neatness and simplicity. Well, uh, then I shift to another topic and mention that the reason I am thinking of presenting, the thought of presenting this here was that last summer I was at a meeting in New York in the embassy, the French embassy. They had a cultural division, which is on Manhattan and different locations from the main embassy. And I was there for a special event, and it, it so happened that, uh, uh, that Louis Nirenberg was also there, and also Cedric Vellani was there. There were different events, music, and some dis discussion had people doing. When my turn came, I said something that I had this web page, I had these things that were interesting in relation to relativity, and uh, the, that, uh, <coughs> but that I said these would be noticed for if they were put into an archive publication, that I could publish essentially the same ideas in as an archive publication that it would be would communicate more than just being on my web page and that idea that suggested to, to the idea of, of using this now I have nothing else to prepared to to present is mathematical research this this is mathematical research over a considerable period of time. And uh, so let me look a, a, a bit there. Yes, well, that is the first page. This, this, this web page that goes back to lectures that at different times in the, in the past. There was, there was one at Penn State, and there was one also at the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies, or, or Dublin University Institute, I forget for sure which. And these, are, these can actually be dug up from records on the internet. So, you see that uh, whichever way you, version you look at it, this, this handwriting is sometimes more effective than, than what you can use on the computer. Over here, this seems good. This is, instead of a, being a second order equation, equations of vacuum in Einstein, this is the equation of vacuum but it is fourth order. And uh, this uh, a standard operator, 
Einstein tensor is derived from the Ricci tensor, but uh, this is relating to the Einstein. It's not quite the same as the Ricci tensor. It has it has reverse trace. I think. This is a Riemann tensor with four elements. Or that is the Ricci tensor. Well, let's see. Do I go on to the next page? There's a lot of shiny reflections. Does it want to push just one thing? Mm -hmm. so want to the next page? Yes. I can't do it with this. Something here. Well, there's a, a long, uh, a long trail of thinking that yes. It was a, a long, long trail of thinking that led me to these, these equations, but uh, it came originally from the idea that the uh, red, the red shift, might be a f somehow a false effect of, that came due to a loss of energy f from light in a large field, and this is somehow related. To to Yukawa fields, and I, I started thinking about what could be the partial differential equations of, of such fields. I went through some calculations, and what came out by surprise, I saw some uh, fourth order expression in uh, these uh, these tensor calculus quantities that was scale-free in this character. This is a celebrated property of the Einstein equations. This thing related to it. it's scale-free. The structure of a large black hole might be the same basically as a small black hole or other aspects of the scale-free character, which seems nice if you have no basis of scale. But, of course, one can wonder about things like that. So, the scalar equation, the equation that was written down first, the general equation, gives a scalar equation if uh, if one does the standard uh, summing over all the four four components, and so once the n is dimensions here, now it turns out also that if n equals four. The whole thing is 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 very simplified. But I will be able to show that later. I hope. <laughs> I, I don't have it all 
under control. But uh, this is just proposed as something that may be of interest if you are a, a, a mathematician or a physicist, mathematical physicist, astronomer. So you, you may be concerned. Recently, for example, there's been a lot of talk about dark energy. And there was dark matter b before that. But these concepts, if you look into them, are concepts that derive from Einstein relativity, or, and also for the, from the popular series of an expanding universe, like an FR, let's see, FLMR universe, Friedman, uh, let's see, Friedman, Demetri, Robertson, Walker, that's F L R W universe, a popular theory of something that's entirely symmetric uh, as far as two dimensions are concerned, and then there are two spatial dimensions. Well, I we didn't get that right. This, it expands in, in four, three spatial dimensions and changes in time and uh, this uh, allows this is what later on allows what Einstein was concerned with back in 1915 I think when he introduced a, a variation a, a cosmological term which was described by capital letter lambda and what that did made it possible for a, a balanced universe in his theory to have what seemed like the qualities, the qualities of the observational universe at that time, which was 1915. And uh, it, it seemed uh, that the universe needed some gravitation of matter that could be recognized. But the astronomer looks out into the space and doesn't, in effect, doesn't see any matter. <laughs> it's like a, a vacuum asymptotically. You have the, the matter, recognizable matter in the, in the, in the, this galaxy. And we see much more of it now. We can find some planets out, but they're, 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 they are like dark matter, since uh, they don't, don't show much. And so uh, one, one thing this could do, it's like alternative, it can be an alternative, at least for the cosmological constant that Einstein used at that time. It could have been used instead of the cosmological constant, but it would mean using fourth order partial differential equations instead of two. There's, I think there's much more to be learned uh, about dark matter or dark energy. Also, my opinion, my personal opinion, was whether or not something like this this fourth order equation could be relevant was influenced by the work done in Geneva uh, with the Large Hadron Collider. You see, the, the theory of the Higgs boson involves the idea of quantization of gravity. There's just, you said, there's some sort of big heavy particle there, and what does it do? What does it cover? Underlying that, there's standard model theory where the quantization of light and more elaborations upon the original quantization of light, uh, electromagnetic energy. And so the idea of some quantization of gravity, well, maybe there can be that. that and so then, 
maybe something like this will be will, will fit very very appropriately. So uh, the, I I I know I, the, the the search is not finished yet, but I I can write up the uh, the archive version and it have some of this, the same ideas that I have up to the present time. Now, is it time for me? Oh, you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>